you know, Orzo is currently standing at the top of a roughly 500 foot tall tower, give or take. Looking over the edge, you see down to the bottom of a canyon that is, again, 500 feet or so below you. Look, you see just fog and clouds as you look over the edge. You cannot see the ground. From your perspective at the top of the tower, looking off to the west, you see the ledge, the hill, um, cliffside that you guys approach from. The bridge is directly below you where you're standing that you cross to enter the tower. Uh, looking to the north, you see as the veil stretches forward and then eventually levels out into the plains. The south, it re recedes into the hills. Looking off into the east, you see into the gorge itself. There are different crevices and canyons. On the far eastern wall, there's a waterfall coming down through a ravine that leads to a river that bisects the valley itself. Uh, at the top of the tower here, looking around, um, to the north, west, and south, there are the Krell Nations that stick out. It looks to be that from the scratch marks and scarring on the edges of them, that some of the Falcon Knights use these things to land their various mounts, be it the giant vultures that you currently see flying and circling the tower itself, or some other beast. Um, off to the east, you, de you do see a um, what resembles a telescope that's affixed on a tripod facing directly to the east currently. Yeah, if you want to go take a look at it. All right, I'm going to move you over here. That's where the telescope would be. You're going to take a peek in said telescope, I assume? Okie dokie. Um... I'm assuming at this point you're just leaning down and peeking into the telescope where it's currently aimed. Alright, so as you lean down and peek into this telescope, you see directly across the Sighing Valley. It's pointing into the ravine that the waterfall appears to be falling out of. From behind the waterfall, you see a hoarded figure step out and then quickly recede. This telescope is, I mean, it's it's akin to, like, an astronomical telescope that you would use to see the stars. They have it aimed off to the east, directly into a valley that's winding into the cliffside. Beyond that, standing up here is... um. What was this bugger's name again? Oh, Lord Commander Mersuk. Well, at this time, uh, due to you guys are going around, we're kind of going back in time because he disconnected a little bit. Uh, at this juncture, we are going to say that you would have seen him step down the tower and he returns 10, 15 minutes later in his evening attire as he has previously invited you all to stay for an evening's feast to celebrate their 10th year. Alright. I mean, there is the other, um, the priest that traveled with you guys who's currently standing at the top of the tower with you there, if you wanted to speak with him. Otherwise, you are free to mail about your spellbook. Alrighty. Thalon, you are currently resting in the comfortable apartment of uh, Miss Savra. Oh, a joy. Hooray for Savara! You have just finished a uh, rather... Hmm, how should we explain this? <laughs> there you go. You finished your vigorous exercise with her. Oh, man. Amusing. I 
had made notes here for this, and now I just got to figure out where I put the notes at. <sighs> well, you are currently resting in bed with Miss Salra. Is there anything you wish to speak with her about? Oh, as you are resting in bed, she sighs, looks a little guilty for a moment and attempts to avert her gaze trying not to meet yours um, after a few moments she eventually turns to you and attempts to confide in you um, I, I I have something to I need to tell you something these these nights aren't all about the water deep society they're um we're there's something going on and there's with a, a cult of sorts, with the elemental air, they're trying to, they claim they're trying to annihilate the enemies of Waterdeep, but the the ones I see attacking are the citizens, the travelers, merchants of Waterdeep. I, I don't know what to do with myself. I don't know where to go. Did sh did they have any sort of unique emblem or symbol on them? What, what can you explain what the symbol looked like? <laughs> I'm going to give me one minute. I'm going to pull it up for you here just to show it to you. Just gotta remember where the hell I put it at. Um, this is what we'll do. I'm gonna shrink it down, and I'll put it in the room right there for you. An inverted triangle with three prongs, looking kind of like a fork or trident coming out of the top. They're, they're probably emissaries. They're likely answer to um, a, there's an elven woman hiding in the cliff faces to the east. Uh, she calls herself the queen. P please don't tell anybody I told you this. Heading into the caves? I, I feel like if I if I left now, I would just alert somebody else to something. Your arrival was rather abrupt and... Well, I'm sh I don't know. He's planning something. I can tell. I don't know where else to go. <laughs> uh, if you wanted to come with you, yeah, you're going to have to roll persuasion. It's, uh, <laughs> no. Plus five. No, she, she seems very conflicted. Um, you can tell from the look in her eyes and the way she's gazing about the room that she wants to come with you, but she just doesn't feel like it would be the correct move at this time. She nods. So thank you. Um, maybe 
maybe if uh, if things seem safer around here, I'll, or something happens, I, I don't know. Right now, I feel like it, it's better if I just stay here. We, sh we should probably get um, cleaned up and get ready for the uh, the feast. So we'll say you guys busy yourselves uh, cleaning up and making yourselves presentable for the coming feast. Um, Sinestra, is there anything else you wanted to do while you're down here playing with the chickens? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll move you down. So, as you make your way down the steps to the bottom level of the tower, you find yourself sitting in what looks to be a rookery of sorts. Um, it's a circular landing surrounded by various circle shafts from the, uh, of the spiral staircase. Um, the landing is piled high with supplies, bales of straw, and radiating from the landing are the 12 stalls which are filled with straw covered floors. Various harnesses, riding crops, and saddles hang along the walls and among hooks and such outside of each of the stalls. There is a swinging wooden door that cap either end of each stall. One is leading from the tower to the outside of the tower in the open air. Um, there appears to be a one of the feather girl lights he's milling about looks like he's uh, attempting to organize the supplies down here in one way or another <coughs> hello uh, is something I can help you with uh, this is um, well it's I guess you could call it our supplies supply room here. Um, we do have extra goods for sale if you're looking to purchase something. Oh, you know, the usual. Armor, shields, swords, belts, bows, arrows, um, saddles. There's Nigos. <laughs> okay. He, does, he rumbles around and um, directly in front of the stairs and against the wall at kind of... Um, leads out from the bottom of the landing there is a stack of four boxes um, they're all roughly maybe a foot or so wide six inches or so tall he so, um, opens up the top box and he rummages around and then he goes um let's see here and he sets that to the floor and goes down he sets each of them out around himself opens each one of them up briefly glancing and he closes them before stacking them again and once again opening the top box he goes it looks like i've got about three healing potions and one greater healing potion i could spare if you're interested in purchasing those light on your glove something of magical nature unfortunately I'm not authorized to sell anything of that sort to you If you do favors for the tower here or the uh, Lord Commander, perhaps we can expand our wares available to you. Alrighty, there you go. You're back upstairs. <laughs> Where you head? Your carriage is currently just tied to a fence post um, right outside the bridge. There are a couple of the feather girl knights that are standing watch around it. They don't appear to care, have any carriers to whatever meager goods you've got packed away in there, which is mostly just your traveling supplies. All right. 
<laughs> Alrighty. Um, is there anything else that you guys want to do this evening before you move on to the feast? Alrighty. Um, are all of you going to attend this feast, or is somebody going to attempt to just avoid it altogether? So you're going to skip the feast? All right. Um. Well. So you're sitting out in the carriage. I am assuming that the remainder of you guys are all going to go and join the feast. Okay. So you follow Savra down the steps into the dining hall there. Um. We're gonna say Orzo and Gladwin do the same. make your way around this rather large dining hall table and eventually after a couple of minutes the Lord Commander makes his way down um, over the next five minutes or so various servants and initiates of the tower here bring up you know, different platters of food and the like um, this is just it's a large great hall that spawn, spans roughly half the diameter of this tower almost level between the over large windows and tapestries depicting scenes of gallant knights on flying hippogriffs fighting dragons jousting with one another among the clouds high on the walls are mounted the heads of griffins wolverines owlbears manacles and other various beasts the long curved table here is set for what now is a rather um generous feast stretches before you between the tallest twin hearths. As the Lord Commander makes his way down to the front of the table, he's clad in his finest garments of a velvet brocade. The knights feast at this large curved table in the Great Hall. Um, Lord Commander Marsaka sits at the head of one of the tables and says, Honored guests, tell us of your adventures here in the Sumbering Hills. Let us aid you in any way that we can. Where is your uh, fair skin, companion? As he's looking about trying to get a fix to where Sinestra is. Uh, so he's opted not to join us this evening. Very well. So, tell me, what have you accomplished in your time here? So you fought the dead. Oh, well, you wouldn't be standing here otherwise, would you? <laughs> well, tell me, what are these great battles against the walking dead? An, an ogre in a basement. An undead ogre? How, how in the world did it get there? What town was this? It's troubling news indeed. It's one of the major farming villages. It supplies food for Waterdeep. Did you inform the town mayor and the guards? I'm sure you were handsomely rewarded for your efforts then. <laughs> Perhaps not handsomely enough then. He nods consent, takes a sip from his cup of wine in front of him.
Did you find any clues? Anything that may point toward the source of the problems? As you mentioned the East, um, Saver, who's sitting next to you, reaches under the table and lightly pinches your leg as if they, you know, keep that to yourself kind of thing. To the East, you say? What makes you think things are coming from the East? Monasteries, you say? Hmm. The only monastery we know of within this area is that of the Sacred Stones. Have you visited there? He nods. Be sure you do so. There have been some interesting characters seen there as of late. While you uh, folks are having your meal in here, um, Sinestro, the wagon that you are fiddling about in is abruptly knocked aside, tumbling over. You hear a loud screech and see a shadowy figure flying overhead. From inside the tower, you folks hear the panicked footsteps of a couple of men running up the steps. The doors to the Great Hall slam open, banging against the sides of the wall. In marches a frantic soldier who begins shouting, Manicor! It's on the move! It's a Manicor! At this announcement, the Feathergale Knights all rise as one. The feast before them has been unfinished, and they begin to march toward the stables at the base of the tower. Thurl turns to you. We should take this opportunity to slay this monster. He removes a ring from his finger. It's a feathered pattern, golden ring set with a few garnets and holds it aloft. This, this is a prize for the one who brings me the beast's head. He then turns to those present. Join us in our hunt here. If you agree to go on this, we can lend you mounts. And again, this is the prize. I can offer you this and perhaps a little coin in exchange. nods. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Sinestra, are you doing anything as the wagon is overturned on you? Oh, he's the he's on the phone. Okay, I didn't see that. He put he was on his phone. My bad. Alright, well, we're going to let him do his thing for a little bit. Um, Meanwhile, there are four four of the Feather Girl Knights that are assembled at this table here run to the top of the tower. The rest of them go to the base. Um, Lord Commander motions for you to go up top. So if you want to lift, go up there. They'll take you down to the base where you can each find a mount of your own. All right, so you guys all rush to the top of the tower. As you reach there, there are four of the Feathergill Knights assembled in each of the pinnacles, each one of them mounted upon a giant vulture looking back at you expectantly with a hand reached out. Um, Fallon, as you attempt to get up, Sarva pulls you aside, holding you in the stairwell, and warns you to be careful and not to trust them. Watch yourself. Okay. She blushes a little bit, gives you a hug before sending you on your way. Uh, at the top of the tower, the moon illuminates this misty canyon below the, the feather gale spire. Uh, in the far distance, a single shard of darkness is moving, flitting in and out of the mist. And the shadow sinks beneath the banks of the clouds, lost again from sight. Each of you are flown to the base of the tower, or there are a series of 
hippogriffs arrayed around you. Um, you are each instructed that if you wish to fly, to mount one of the beasts, and it will carry you to your destination. You guys all going to attempt to ride one of these hippogriffs? <laughs> all right, I need you guys to roll an animal handling check. You have advantage on this because the knights are helping you. You can roll again because I gave you advantage, so you can see if you get higher. Nope, 15. All right. Oh, the natural 20. Nice. All right, Thalon, you managed to find your way into the saddle as you do so. Um, you seem to be rather comfortable with the beast, and it's calm at your touch. It doesn't react or attempt to jump away from you. The knight makes a few adjustments to the saddle and uh, tightens a couple of straps and then goes over to the barricading door and, after a few minutes, unleashes the four latches on it and sprawls it open before you, opening it to the misty air of the night. You yank on the reins lightly, and the hippogriff, as if understanding what your intent is, leaps off into the clouds flying ahead. Orzo, you approach the beast, and the knight, who is a couple of steps behind you, is coming up to help what he assumes to be a enfeebled old man, and is quite surprised when you just gingerly hop upon the beast and seem to take control of it without any effort whatsoever. Uh, it turns back to you and nuzzles your hand gently as a you know, friendly and welcoming figure as once was once again in the saddle. The knight is quite a bit surprised and taken back. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you see a small fint of a jealous, fint jealous glare on his face before he goes and again unlatches the doors, allowing you to exit the tower. As for the other ones, uh, does this guy have an animal handling? Welcome back, Mr. Sinestra. So, while you were outside and they were enjoying the banquet, your uh, wagon that you were fiddling about in and to avoid the banquet was knocked over by a manticore flying overhead. You are currently laying in the side of the wagon and its top of belongings of your supplies are strewn about the ground in front of you all, stuck in the canvas of the wagon itself. Thankfully, none of them look to be broken. What do you wish to do? And the horses are tied to the wagon and uh, the one wagon hitch looks to be broken from the impact, though the horses appear to be thankfully unharmed. All right. Um, so while you were doing that, the guards are frantically running about the tower. You hear them screaming and yelling about a manticore attack, and a manticore has been spotted flying around the valley. Um, as you, I'm assuming you're going into the tower at this point? Well, the two guards that were with the wagon have ran across you into the tower. The tower doors remain open straight into or the stairwell as you see the frantic footsteps of several different knights initiates either running up or down the tower. All right, go ahead and do a nature check. Nature check. <laughs> uh, you don't have any bonuses to that it looks like uh, from a glance of what you can tell none of the horses seem to be wounded um, just looking over to the various bits of barding and um, they are scuffing at the ground trying to just get away from things, but because of the way the broken hitches and harnesses are and the straps around them, they're unable to move. So while they're struggling against it, the weight of the wagon turned over in this fashion it appears to be anchoring them to place. And it occurs to you that it's probably fortuitous this happened, is it probably saved the lives of these horses. It's maybe five feet or so in front of you is the straight 400 foot drop to the canyon below.
All right, that's animal handling. Fucking beautiful. Horse whisperer Sinestro walks over and, after muttering a few words and gently patting the horses, you easily calm them down. Um, they appear to, you know, they're, they're comforted by your approach and they appear very safe with you nearby. They stop fidgeting about and it allows you to easily, if you so wish, unhitch the horses from the wagon. All right, so looking at the various straps and such of the horse, um, looking at the two of them, the one that was on the left side of the wagon, the various harnesses and hitches and stuff that had tied this horse previously to the wagon are all bent and snarled. A couple of them are broken and tangled among the various fragments of shattered wood of what once had been the bench, front axle, and wheel of the wagon on the left side of it. Uh, the one on the right side of the wagon appears to be better off. None of the harnesses or various straps of leather and such have any damage to them. There is a slight wear to them that looks like just the force of the wagon being torn where it's a little extended and torn quite a bit, but it doesn't look like it would cause any problems to it in the long run. If need be, you feel that you could probably just take unbuckle that one and adjust it a little bit to one side or the other and just punch a new hole and it will be just fine. Well, roll investigation if you want to try and see if you feel that they're correct or not in what they're telling you. I don't know. From what you can tell of the large scratch marks that are in a set of what looks like three claws. Um, if you think like Jurassic Park and the raptors scratching at the steel walls, it kind of looks like that. Um, just raking the side of the wagon on the uh, side that's facing up now, which is the right side of the wagon. The one wagon wheel on the front side, on the right side, is also damaged. It appears it may have caught a claw or something, as the outer iron rim of the wheel is broken open. Um, aside from that, the canvas on the right side here, facing up, is torn a little bit. There are the what are amounts to a total of six distinct claw marks, six distinct claw marks, each in a group of three across the side of the wagon. Um, glancing about as you look to the north side of the tower and then back to the south, you see a large blackish figure flitting in and out of the clouds and mists of the canyon valley before disappearing off into the clouds below. While you are doing this, um, glancing off to the south of the tower, you do see your four traveling companions, each of them astride a hippogriff, flying off south in pursuit of the supposed manticore. You just gonna hang out here while I do this? He's with them. All right, so you make all right, you make your way into the tower, um, while going down the steps down to where you were previously at in the stables. Uh, while you were down there, the man that was messing around with the um, the goods down here appears to be busy in one of the stables off to the side, where you assume your traveling companions had previously been with these various mounts going off into the night sky. Speaking of which, Orzal, you don't see shit out here in the pitch dark. You are, thankfully due to the amazing roll you did, your natural 20 there, the griffin has fallen in line behind Thalon, following him. Um, you do see the faint shimmer of the armor and his shield on his back as the 
the, his hippogriff is flying away. You catch glimpses of it here and there from the moonlit as it comes in and out of the mists. But otherwise, you don't see shit. Orso's flying blinds. <laughs> Is there anything that you would like to do to try and rectify this, or are you just going to go with it? Alright, so you cast your light spell on the end of your staff, which allows you to illuminate 30 feet around you. I'm going to put a torch on you to give you a light. So you can now see up to 30 feet around you. You are aware of your surroundings, and you feel confident that at the very least... You're not going to get surprised by something just ripping up out of the clouds below you and knocking you off your mount. Uh, Sinestra, you hear the knight that was down here previously in this hall or dealing with these goods is, like I said, fiddling around with one of the various stables off to the side. Um, it's up to you what you decide you want to do here. All right, roll investigation. Oh, you wanted to sneak first. You should roll stealth before you do investigation. My bad. Go ahead and do that now. Yeah, roll stealth first. All right, you feel fairly confident that um, he's not going to notice you. From what you hear, he's appears to be wrestling with one of the harnesses in the room behind behind or on the opposite side of the stairwell. You hear various clattering of different latches and um, buckles and such. He's muttering himself, fuck, how the fuck to get to the table like this? He's just fussing with it at this point. You rummage about and all you find are... Um, there are five quivers that have roughly between 17 and 20 arrows between each. There are four bows leaning against the wall. Hanging on the one wall, there are three hand axes, four swords. Piled up in one of the corners and boxes, there are four suits of leather armor. There are two sets of scale mail armor and five shields. And again, the various boxes that had had the healing potions in it. Roll sleight of hand. All right. As you deftly pick up the three healing potions and the single greater healing potion, the guard comes around the corner and it appears to him that you are just coming down the steps. And he says, oh, good, you're here. Your companions just left. They're chasing after the magic going into the canyon. Are you going to join them? Perfect. Um... We're out of hippogriffs. I do have two giant vultures here if you'd like to fly in one of those. Uh, great. So he unlocks the door after a couple of minutes and leads you into the cell. And there is, sitting here with wings folded, pecking at the stray, the uh, the hay and straw on there. Um, you hear a squeak, 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 and something scurrying around about it. Um, it appears to be paying you no heat at this point in time. Yeah, um, first you wanted to let know that you are here and you're intent to ride it. Um, if you can keep it calm, I'll get the saddle on it and then I can strap you in there. Alright, so roll your end of my line. Oh. Well, you have advantage because he's assisting you, so roll it again. You barely manage to keep it calm. It stops flapping its wings about, and it's as you walk around to the front of it. Um, thankfully, it manages. It as you were coming up, it managed to catch that mouse, and it's distracted by enjoying its meal. So between that and the assistance of the feather girl knight in the room with you, you guys managed to calm it down. He straps the saddle onto it. Um, he helps you. He helps you into the saddle. 
and uh, points to there are a pair of what look to be um, handholds or grasps on the front of the sandal, one sa sandal, saddle, one to the left and right of it, right behind the neck of the creature. Um, he tells you if you want to fly to the left, pull up gently on the right one. If you want to fly to the right, pull up gently on the left one. If you want it to go down or up, you know, push down or pull up both at the same time. It should follow your direction. He's trained them well. He goes about unlocking the four lock bars that are holding these large wooden iron-bound doors to the outside of the tower open. After what appears to be an eternity, it's roughly two, minutes, two or three minutes, the door is finally open, and the bird, without hesitation, just flaps off and goes without being a word. Happy to be out of that tiny little cell. Um, as for the rest of you, you are roughly 120 feet or so ahead of Sinestra, who's playing catch-up at this point in time. Um, for those of you with dark vision, your vision is limited to roughly 100 feet or so in front of or below you in this canyon due to the fog and various tidbits of light and moonlight that come through in the night sky. Um, or as all, your vision is limited to about 50 feet or so with your light spell. Those of you that want to attempt to find this manticore, I need you to roll a perception check. <laughs> Flying about, you see the various knights heading off in a southeasterly direction. You feel that that's probably the way to go. Um, or so I'm assuming that you're going to attempt to follow the rest of them. Alright. So you guys go about here. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Alrighty. Of your little searching party, I want one of you guys to roll a d20 and add 5 to it. Alrighty, well, you guys, um, flying through there, following Fallon's lead, you see yourselves in front of you, about 80 feet or so, with a manticore flying about. You have managed to get the drop on this thing, ahead of the various knights. What do you want to do? Alrighty. Woohoo! Alrighty, well, the man course in front of you. I need everybody to roll initiative. Yeah, you'll be able to get him up to him. Damn, Fallon with a 20. <laughs> What's that come to you with your modifier, Joe? Okay. Um, Sinestra. The speed of a cobalt. You have cautious boots on. Now oh, he's got cautious boots on. Well, there's Zerio. That guy's got a stupid initiative. Um, no, because the overall is higher than that, and then because his dexterity modifier is higher than Thalon's, he supersedes it. And then that's going to bring him falling up the end of it. Uh, Zerio comes flying up beside you. Turns you with a grin and says, <clears throat> Ten gold to the one that brings this bitch down! And draws upon the power of his bracers and pulling out the bow of air, straddling it in front of him, and lets loose a shaft of lightning. He, don't, he doesn't know that, only you know that. What's the role for his bow? Oh, man, I believe this thing is... Yeah, some stupid number. 
go dexterity. He lets loose an arrow and it shrieks off into the night to the left of the manticore, missing it as it barely dodges off behind him. Thalon, it's your turn. Alrighty, do her up, man. You cast your spell, and it's seeing the divine light coming from your hand. It's a beacon in this dark night. It easily just dodges to the side of it, avoiding it. <laughs> it's not over yet! He cries behind you. Uh, Fallon, because you have made yourself a wonderful target to this creature with your giant glowing light, it's going to flick its tail at you, releasing a flurry of spikes and barbs flying out behind you. Thankfully, your hippogriff, um, you assume, has probably seen battle with these things before from the various scars and the like the front of the beast. It, outside of your command, just poof, does a barrel roll off to the left. I need you to roll an athletics check. You cling to the saddle and definitely hold on to it for your life before it writes itself back up in the air. <laughs> yes, indeed. Or is all it's your turn. You hop off your hippogriff, you're going to fall to the ground. You are flying 200 feet in the air above the canyon floor. In front of you, about 60 feet at this point, is a manticore. It just shot a barrage of tail spikes at Thalon. No, you can't. Uh, if you want, you can spur your mount to fly faster to catch up to it. I mean, you saw Thalon shoot a giant golden ball of energy in front of you. Um, and the arrow of uh, Xerio's bow would have lit up the sky for a brief moment, allowing you to catch a glimpse of where it is ahead of you. Alright, so you spur your mount to fly forward, going faster faster to try and catch up to this mentor, which is easily enough done. These hippogriffs are far lighter and, you know, leaner beasts than the manticore itself. Um, you manage to close the gap by about 40 feet or so. You can now barely see in front of you, between the clouds and the shafting rays of moonlight, the manticore. It is 50 feet in front of you. If you wish to roll an attack, you will have disadvantage on it due to your no night vision. Nope, right now, you're just you're in the air. Both miss. Yeah, your four would have been the role that you go with. If you, even if you add your spell attack modifier to it, you're not going to hit the creatures that you see. Alrighty. Um, let's see. That brings us to Sinestra. You are flying rapidly on your vulture. Your giant vulture it appears to fly at a speed faster than these hippogriffs. You manage to close the distance. You are now um, roughly 20 feet or so behind Zerio, Thalon, and Cloudwind, which are still the three of them grouped up. Uh, Orzal, from what you can tell, appears to be 40 feet or so ahead of them. Uh, from what you can gather in the direction where they are heading and where Orzal is up ahead, you feel it's probably ahead of Orzal, but if you wanted to get a clearer sight on it, you'll have to spur your mount to fly faster.
All right, roll an attack at disadvantage. Oh, you're going to go with a 13, which would miss, unfortunately. Uh, however, no, it would, no, it would hit him, it would miss him too with that roll, so we're not even going to try and roll that. Alright, uh, that brings us to the Kaladwin, seeing things going and how the attacks are not making any impact, he spurs his mount to fly faster and uh, he comes up so he is, um, about in line, running with pace with you, Orzo, um, <clears throat> He turns to you and goes, Ahead! Nine o'clock! To your right! Pointing out the direction where the manacore is before. Um, raising his left hand in the sky, you see a shimmer of golden energy surround his hand, and he is going to cast an Eldritch Blast of Divine Energy at this creature. And that's going to hit! Hooray! You guys have done damage to the Manticore. You, yeah, you hear it screech in pain as it turns back and glares angrily at Kaladwin and begins to bank slightly to the left as if circling you and coming back in your direction. Uh, let's see, you're going to back to the top of the turn, so back to Zirio's turn. He's going to roll his attack, spurring his mount to fly forward to attempt to catch up. And he misses. Thalon, your turn. Uh, currently, from where you are, you are um, roughly 40 feet behind Orzo, Zerio, and Cloud. One at this point, they are all ahead of you, arrayed in kind of like a flying V pattern, attempting to catch up to this thing. It is about 80 feet to your left-ish it's just attempting to bank around to get a view to basically like do a drive by at you. So what you could do if you wanted to try and close the distance, you could instead of flying straight ahead, fly a little bit off to the you know straight to the left at an angle. All right, so we'll say that you can easily close the distance to cover the that range between the two of them. No, rolled a 17 natural plus modifiers. It would not work. Here, as it deftly dives out of the way, your bells chime on deft ears in the wind. It's now the Manticore's turn. Um, it is going to make its attacks on Kaladwin, as that's the one who rolled against it previously. Uh, let's see if I add that to it. That would hit him. So he's going to take some damage. Um, Kaladwin takes four piercing damage as the hip reverts, sorry, the, hip, the manticore flies around and flicks its tail in his direction as a barbed spike wings out and embeds itself in his shoulder. He takes a moment to stabilize himself on the mount. Um, he appears to be wounded a little bit, though it does not bother him too much. Alrighty, and then he's going to make another attack. This one is going to be at youth, Alan. A similar Missile from its tail comes flying past, whizzing past the underbelly of your hippogriff, nowhere near you. And then finally, he's going to make one more attack toward Kaladwin, which is going to hit. And he's going to take a total of eight points of damage from that creature. Is another spike from the beast embeds itself in his chest. Um, that brings us to Orzol's turn. It is now behind you and to the left, roughly 30 feet, Orzol. going to cast light on his face. I like it. He needs to make a deck save. Oh, what's your spell DC? 15? 
He rolled a natural one. Foof, light looming in his face, you hear it squawk in alarm as it frantically tries to paw at his face and loses momentum and begins to plummet to the air, falling roughly 80 feet before it catches itself. That would be your turn. Are you going to attempt to close the distance more, or are you just going to stay where you're at? Alright, well, it's now a bright beacon. You can easily see where it is. Um, Sinestra, it's your turn. To the left of you, about 80 feet or so below you, maybe a total of 90 feet or so in distance, you see the manticore, its face, a light as bright as day. Well, you're not rolling a disadvantage anymore because it's, uh, yeah. So you would go with your initial roll there, which would miss. Yeah, that would miss. Uh, that brings us to Kaladzman's turn, who, not feeling too kind about being speared a couple of times by this thing, is going to heal himself using two of his healing light abilities. So I'm going to roll 2d6 to heal him. Helps if I type things right, plus his Charisma modifier. Uh, he's going to regain 11 points of health, and that will be his turn. Uh, top of the round brings us back to Zerio, who again raises his bro. Turning down to the now shining beacon, he turns to you and says, Thanks for the light! And let's loose the arrow. Hooray! He does seven points of damage, two natural ones. Wow, that's rough. As the arrow embeds itself into the hide of the creature. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. That brings us down to Thalon's turn. Um, it is flying toward you, roughly 20 feet from you at this point. Um, it is coming up from below you. If you want to fly down and swing at it, yeah, by all means, go for it. Oh, uh, you add your plus six to that, so that would bring you up to... Yeah, that would hit. Roll your damage. So as you see the creature below you, again, light and bright as day, thanks to Orzol's brilliant tactical move, you urge your hippogriff to turn into a dive, and you see fly past it, spiraling to the side, you lightly brush its underbelly with your fingers, sending forth a wave of necrotic energy into the beast. It howls in pain as the energy courses through its body, and will open wounds visibly and begin to wounds begin to rip open across its belly. It is not happy. That ends your turn. Um, but because you are flying through its space in a dive action, uh, it's going to get an attack of opportunity at you. Um, that's going to hit you. You take four points of slashing damage as its claw rakes across you while you fly past. He rolled a one on his damage. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. That brings us to Orzol's turn. All right, roll your attack. Plus, what's your modifiers for it? Seven added to that. Nope, that's going to miss, unfortunately. You cast your fireball, and it. That one's brave dive move to cast his uh, inflict wounds when it calls the creature to win and flap the attempt to avoid him raking out. And as it does so, it dodges out of the space where you're previously aiming for. Your fireball scorches between the two of them, pocking into the ground below. 
Um, as your fire mole goes whizzing past, the four falcon knights who had left the tower with you are now... You can see the torches of their four um, mounts flying off in the distance, roughly 100 feet or so north of you, coming from the direction of the tower. You hear muffled shouts of, They're over here! No, this way! Over here! They found it! They are making their way toward you. It is now your turn, Sinestra. Alright, so you fly in close, you're 30 feet away from it, you're casting your Witch Bolt. Nice. Easily done. Wow, yeah, that's gonna hit. Whew, an arcing bolt of storm energy lashes between Sinestra and the Manticore and howls in pain as the lightning cackles or crackles across its body, linking the two of them together. This... We are, we are, we are. <laughs> and Claude, been seeing your move, grins and says, Good idea! And comes riding down next to you. As he does, his hand hold, trails his right hand behind him. Shadows begin to form in it. And as he comes by you, a blade of shadow in his hand swings at the manticore. He grins at you and uh, says, maybe as the shadow blade digs into the side of the manticore, uh, that's going to do, I should have rolled this in here instead of rolling it on my thing, but that's all right. Uh, what's his, let's use his charisma modifier. It's 10 points of necrotic damage as the shadow blade rips through the hide of the creature. It's looking pretty goddamn rough, guys. Um, seeing you guys move into melee range with it, and the air a little cluttered around it now, he goes, How the fucking way, you morons? And drawing another arrow and letting loose his fire. Because you guys are providing partial cover to this thing at this point in time, he's going to have to reach a higher AC point, which he manages to reach. Um, let's see. Well, the things that you see is 14. He had to roll at least a 17 to hit it. Let's do some light bolts of arrow. Yeah, lightning arrow, whatever the hell the word is. And to the side of the manticore, it stiffens and begins to let loose a howl of pain before it's turns into a smoking gasp and slams into the canyon below. Clouds of dust flitting around. The corpse that is now a shining beacon on the canyon floor thanks to your light spell. <laughs> so you just flying down letting the witch bolt do its full cast time on it? How long is that supposed to last? That's, no, up to one minute. So that's ten rounds of combat it would last. So as you fly down, just scorching the body at this point, your witch bolt convulsing and it's twitches as the lightning energy ripples through it. The remaining falconates come down and they... It's, it's it's dead, you know. You, you can stop. A rather rank smell is coming off this creature. It smells kind of akin to like rotting flesh. As it's charred and boiled, boiled body begins to boil and pop. It's beyond cooked at this point. It is just a mess. Well, um. I'm not eating that. Are you fucking crazy? It's black.
black as <laughs> You're gonna persuade him to try it? Roll persuasion. Why don't you eat it first? Slight of hand check. Yeah, no. So, uh... Who's the chicken now? You're gonna take an actual bite of this thing? Roll a constitution save. Mm -hmm. Oh. You choke down the, me the meat and as it begins to have a bit of a rank taste, you <laughs> spit it out on the ground in front of you. He looks to the, uh, the three remaining Falcon Gale Knights surrounding you now and for support, and the three of them kind of, you said you would if he ate it. He reluctantly takes a bite of the meat. Um, and unlike you, he's not smart enough to spit it out. So you see him win some pain. <laughs> Vomit up a bit. Um, he takes two points of poison damage. <laughs> uh, at this point, um, uh, Zio and Cladwin come and land next to you, still astride their mounds. Orzo, are you still up in the sky or have you landed? Alright, so you guys come and land next to, uh, Sinestra, who was just finished thoroughly electrocuting and charring this thing and convincing one of the Falcon Gale Knights to attempt to try this and watching him vomit all over the ground. Uh, so, that's... What are you going to do now? The guy still heaving... <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you... I'm telling you killed it. Leave it here. <laughs> There's there was a whole feast that we were about to eat here before this chucklehead here came and yelled at us. Why don't you stay here and enjoy your feast? Xavier suggests to him. <laughs> I guess we're walking here, boys. Uh, the four remaining knights have, um, all saddled back up for the horse. They help the one who has been furiously vomiting and now has covered the saddle with vomit up onto his saddle. They appear to be flanking him and just slowly taking him back to the tower. The fourth one who is riding trail behind them and just basically keeping watch. They're off ahead of you. Uh, you guys wait two or three minutes. They're, you can no longer see them. They're just gone in the clouds. <clears throat> A 
Is she called the queen? Zero asks you. He reaches into his pack and pulls forth a leather scroll case. Um, cylindrical in design. Pops the cork. And pulls out leather. And just holds it out in front of whoever wants to take it. <clears throat> I should take it from me. Just, I found that in the tower. The room will be just before we jumped out the window. It was on the desk. As you unroll the piece of paper, it's a letter addressed to the commander. It says, Masaka, we are pleased to hear about the outcome of your altercation with the Black Earth cult. We praise you for capturing one of their prisoners. This noble woman from Waterdeep has an interesting tale to tell, and we shall enjoy interrogating her further. Keep a close watch on the Sacred Stone Monastery. I want to know what our enemy is planning to do next. Your beloved queen, Eresi Kalanoth. Who's in the commander's room? I also found this, and he pulls out a scroll and hands it to you, Orzo. That might be of use to the old one. As you unroll it, it's a spell scroll. Uh, if you want to see what it is, roll an arcane check. You made it. This is a uh, scroll of Skyrite. If you so wish, when you cast a spell, you can cause the ten words to form in some part of the sky that you can see. The, the words appear to be made of clouds, and they remain in place for the spell's duration, which is roughly an hour. After that, the, the words will dissipate, and the spell ends. A strong wind will disperse the clouds and end the spell early, though. So if you want, you can... Add that to your spell book, or whatever the hell you want to do with it. It's a wizard spell scroll. Well, if you use it as a scroll, yeah, it'll use it. If you write it to your spell book, you'll consume the scroll, but then at any point in the future when you want to do it, you can prepare that spell. Yeah, it'll take you you think it'll take you roughly two hours to pen it into your spell book. <clears throat> Cat wants to play too. <laughs> Let me play. <laughs> he looks in his belt pocket, and the cat that he has with him is sound asleep. Well, I think we've at least earned their trust for now. They don't suspect anything almost at this point in time. And I feel that we probably could take a night of rest here, even early in the morning before they awake. <clears throat> All right. So, you guys make your way back to Lay Tower, stepping your way inside. The Falcon Knights all welcome you back upon your return. Um, as you step in 
the commander of the tower is there to greet you and congratulate you on your victory. Oh, here, let me pull you out. There you go. Well done, guys. Uh, I hear you handily destroyed that beast and made sure it's not getting up again anytime soon. Oh, so that's what happened to Phil. Oh, dumb bastard probably deserves it. Well, uh, it's been a uh, interesting evening. Uh, if you would like, there's a set of rooms up here on the first floor. We usually have it reserved for the initiates, but I'll tell them to sleep on the floor somewhere else. And you guys can take the bunks for the night. <laughs> Grins, takes a finger off his ring, and flicks it in your direction. Yeah, takes the golden ring off his finger, and flicks it in your direction, Orzol. <laughs> Alright, roll your dexterity check, Orzol. You said you were going to catch it. Yeah, easy enough. You just, you fumble it a couple times, but you manage to clasp it between your hands. And looking at it, it's just as he said, it's a golden signet ring. It's got, um, it looks to be a crest, an engraved filigree crest across the top of it. Um, it appears to be that of one of the various noble houses, or wealthier houses of Waterdeep. There are a few garnets and bezels engraved in it, and some um, feathers carved to either side of the signet. Made of gold, roughly 250 gold worth. Roll a history check. Roll a history check. Um, Orzal and Talon, you're from the uh, this region. If you want to roll history, you can do the same. <clears throat> so as they're having this discussion, uh, Talon peeks over your shoulder, taking a glance at the things. That's a... Uh, it's a signet of one of the trade houses that runs the docks in the north. Or it runs from the docks in the north in Waterdeep. They're fairly prominent with shipping goods from the isles along the coast up and down between here and Baldur's Gate. Um, from what you know of the shipping routes, they would go from um. They stick fairly close to the shore, so they would go from Waterdeep down south to the shipwright, the major shipwright's isles, and then travel the coast up north, stopping between Baldur's Gate, and then eventually going up to Neverwin Neverwinter before coming back down to shore again. They don't go out toward the Moonshay Isles, where you're from. Fallon, you think that should you want to hold on to this, you might be able to use it to gain entrance into maybe the uh, one of the various warehouses or um, establishments in the northern wars at Waterdeep. Should you want to hold on to it rather than selling it for coin? Well, if you want to eat, there's the feast upstairs. I'll move your asses up there. I mean, at this point, you guys have all... You've basically done the deed. You killed the critter and you've earned your meal. So there you go. <clears throat> you all partake of your meal. Um, It's rather muted conversation, some muttering and... A few of them are asking you questions about the battle. You know, how'd you manage to catch the beast and the like, if you wish to answer any of them? Mm. 
use lightning to catch it. How? Do you have a net or something? How do you make a net of lightning? What are you going to cast the witch bolt on? Um, I'll say it's easy enough for you to manifest a little bit of your Eldritch energy to appear to look like the witch bolt without actually casting the spell. Alright. So you just arc a little bit of Eldritch lightning between your fingers. They help, you know, scoot back in the chair, just a bit of scuffling of the wood against the stone marble floors. Surprised by the, you know, random belt of magic in the chamber over dinner. They weren't expecting you to shoot lightning about in the chamber. I mean, let's uh, let's keep that for outside. The commander says to you. Um, they all kind of look at you and they awkwardly, slowly applaud. Uh, well, well done, old one. I'm sure you were invaluable. <laughs> yep. You do see in the corner of the room, uh, his head hanging out the window, still driving in films. <laughs> you tap him on the shoulder and go to hand him a drumstick. He looks at you wide eyed, covering his mouth with the window. He looks at the jump stick and looks at you. Um, if you want to eat it, you're going to have to roll a persuasion check. <laughs> nope. He looks at the jump stick and just... <clears throat> you're trying to convince him to eat the jump stick. And while you believe it's beneficial, so it's persuasion instead of deception. Um, he turns and throws a jump stick at you. It scatters and runs, runs, rolls across the floor, wrestling next to your boot. I'm not going to use that thing you tell me to. Um, judging from his symptoms, he has caught a infectious disease. Um, you feel that while it may eventually pass, you're not entirely sure it will. Sign Kaladon lifts his staff to the air. It shines brightly for a minute before he taps it on the ground, and there's a shimmer of divine energy. And the man, who mid, suddenly feels better. Thank you, and he just. So you pick the one up off the floor? He picks the chumpstick up, looks at you, and looks to the commander. The commander just kind of shrugs. Waste not, want not. <laughs> takes a bite of it after a couple bites, and it's, it takes a hell of a lot better than what he ate out there in the field. So he just hungrily and greedily drives, chows it down, going to sit down at the table and fills his plate with stuff and just stuffs his face.
Oh, man. All right. <laughs> well, at this point in time, um, sorry, what were you saying, Tom? I was gonna say, at this point in time, you guys have finished your meal. Um, the commander has again informed you that um, should you wish to stay here for the night, which he recommends given the current state of how dark it is outside, and he points out the window and it's pitch black. You guys figure it's probably closer to you know ten, eleven o'clock or so at night at this point. Um, it's, it's not safe to travel. He says you know it's it's not safe to travel these valleys at night, so it's I recommend staying the night here. You can leave early in the morning if you wish. Um, it's, it's too dark to look at it now. I can send uh, the stable keep to look at it in the morning if you'd like. He nods. Very well. I am going to get some sleep. And he heads up the steps and out of sight. Yeah, so... Uh, I'm just going to move you guys down here. You're going down into this room here on the first floor. There are a series of bunk beds. Yeah. Um, Thalon, as you go to step down the steps, uh, Savra tugs at your shirt. And if you want, you can join me. All right. So Thalon and Savra are going to go up to her room. All right, so you take the bunk by the door. Cloud goes and just rests uh, at one of the bunks where there's nobody there. Currently, you guys are the only ones in this room at this point in time. <clears throat> so you guys going to call it a night at this point? Alrighty. Well, you guys have your discussion. Zero walks over and just snuffs up the torch. So, uh, I agree. We should just uh, get some sleep. Alrighty, so you guys going to retire for the evening? Alright. <clears throat> okay, so you're keeping watch of the run. You need to roll perception. So do three perception checks in a row. Since you're going to be staying up and keeping watch of the night. Alrighty. So throughout the night, you um looking about the chamber. As far as you can tell, everybody's laid in their beds. No one comes to bother you in the night. Um, that's really all there is to it. Any of you guys want to do anything while you're going to bed at night? So, you make your way down to the stables. There are, currently, there's no one in the stables in the summer. Alright. <clears throat> Alright. Roll your perception check. So, start with perception. Okay, so, looking about the room. <clears throat> Um, uh, rummaging about, you do find a couple of things that appear to have a little bit of a magical enchantment to them. They appear to be a little better polished, cleaner. Um, 
a little more of a higher quality wear garment than what you're used to or what you see around the rest of the town. All right, so um, what you picked up is a javelin and a set of leather armor. Excuse me, leather armor. There are still those three boxes there that were. All right, so you opened in the other three boxes you hadn't looked in before? <clears throat> All right, well, I need you to roll a stealth check then. Thankfully, it seems like you are rumbling around has not alerted anyone to what you are doing. <clears throat> All right, opening the boxes up, um, they appear to be various vials and potions inside of them. Um, you find a total of nine healing potions, four greater healing potions, two potions labeled heroism, and yeah, let me know when you're ready for them. Nine of them, four greater healing potions, two heroism potions, You should be able to do multiple. You want me to add them to you? All right, give me a second. I'll do it for you. Did you add the one greater that you got earlier in the day too? So add one more of them. So you should have five of them on your total. And then you should have 12 of the regular healing potions. So there we go. I added 12 of them to your inventory. And two potions of heroism. And three potions of water breathing. <clears throat> and that's the only thing exciting you find down there. Beyond that, there's you know, a grand total of seven long swords, five shields, two sets of splint mail, four sets of scale mail. There are three more of those wing gear suits that you found in the previous room if you wanted those. Okay, so add that to your inventory. Um, uh, there are six longbows, comes to a total of, it looks like, at just a glance, probably about 150 or so arrows, another 70 maybe or so bolts. Um, there's two light crossbows, one heavy crossbow, five or six saddles. Um, yeah, you do see seven darts. Okay. And while Romans are on the darts, they're stored in a small box. You do hear the slight jingle of coins inside this box. Alright, so as you rummage around in the box, you find 784 gold pieces. Two hundred and one silver pieces. Four hundred and thirteen copper pieces. <laughs> oh man. Is there anything else you're looking for in this room? I mean, that's pretty much it that you see of value. Like I said, there's various suits of armor. There are some feed for the mounts. There's like four bags of what looks to be like oats or grain that would be used as feed.
Okay, so just, like, I think, I don't know if there's anything in there, but I would just add to your other possessions, like, a bag of feed or something like that. <clears throat> but that's, uh, pretty much anything that catches your attention down there. That's basically all of it. Busy right now, buddy. Give me five minutes, okay? You can lay in my bed if you want. Alright. So you're just gonna try and sneak a set of wing wear into his pack? Alright. Is that your stealth check? <laughs> yeah, you, you go up there and he doesn't even notice you coming in the room, so you can easily just slip it in his bag. Yeah, I'll add it to his inventory. Alright, I'll add that to his inventory. Um, Joe, you might need to refresh your page to see that added to your inventory. I don't know. Um, Coming up the stairs, Sinestra, you did notice that this torch at the top of the stairwell is out. No. Uh, going out and looking in the hall with your dark vision, the torch is still there on the wall. It just looks like it's just been snuffed out. Yeah. 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 All right, so you go back into the dorm here. You checking in the beds? So as you go to check the beds, you go to check the bunk where Zero is sleeping. No one's there. All right, Orizol, you feel the gentle nudging of Sinestra waking you from your sleep. Um, with your passive perception, Thalon, you would have heard some footsteps coming up and down the stairwell from outside. Beyond that, she is peacefully asleep in the bed next to you. Sinestra, as you open the door looking out into the open hall, you find the guard there with his throat slit, blood pooled around the body. Alright, so you tell him how to deal with the straps. <laughs> yeah, you basically you relieve, remove them from the wagon and just tie them to a nearby post that was had a bell affixed to it. Shh. Quiet, Kevin. Or go to your room. Those are your choices. Alright, so as you run up the steps, entering the dining hall room, same thing. The two guards that were stationed here are laying dead in pools of blood. So you run up to the floor where a Thalon is. Um, Alright, so I, I mean, you can either be quiet or you can move quickly. Pick one or the other. No, you're not, you're not, um, I don't think you're proficient in stealth, are you? No, you're not proficient in stealth, you can't. All 
All right, so you, I need you to roll stealth then, if you're being quiet. Yeah, you're not very quiet right now. You were a little panicked, um, coming up the steps and seeing the people that at previously earlier in the night were your companions are now laying dead in pools of blood. Uh, um, the doors are all closed on this floor. Uh, you gonna try them? That door is unlocked. Yes, Thalon, you would hear him. Alright, so you open the door and look in the room. Thalon is laying in the bed. He's has himself pitched up on one of his elbows, just looking toward the door, his hand ready on the weapon, waiting for somebody to come in. So you wake up Cyrus. What's what's going on? She takes a letter from you with a confused look on her face. Alright, so, um... Are you going to check the other doors? Alright, the other... It's unlocked. You find him... Laying in his bed in a pool of blood. top tower, there is the single lone guard that was at the top of this tower. He is leaning over the edge, his body hanging limp, blood just pouring from the neck. It's, um, that was his mount, and it's picking at his body. You have previous experience riding these things. You have an idea of how to ride them at this point. You still need to roll an animal handling check, though. That's well enough. I mean, you're familiar with the DC. It's pretty low at this point, so you can easily ride it. Where are you going to head with it? Alright, so you're going to take the Pidgeotto. As you fly to the bottom of the tower, you see Zerio sitting on a rock with an axe of ice that's stained red at the edge of it, just casually cleaning it. Couldn't be trusted. It took care of a problem. Couldn't just be sure that it would be done right if I told you. No offense, but you're not the quietest one here. <laughs> Alright, so you barge back into Sarah's room. She's looking panicked, but she is now dressed. What? How? I mean, you lead her to the body, and all you find is there is, the commander is dead. There is a clean cut across his throat. He just releases his grip around the hand, around the axe, and it just shatters into dust and blows off into the wind. <clears throat> Talon, what are you doing? Oh yeah, she's freaking the fuck out. She doesn't know what to do at this point. Um, you're going to need to roll a persuasion to calm her down. Yeah, no, she's frantic. You said you woke everybody up. Oh, his passive perception would have been enough to hear you waking him up anyway. Yeah, he's... Uh, he's, um... 
He's like lingering behind you all. He's standing on the bridge watching from a distance at this point. Kind of keeping to himself. Yeah, he's just... Alright, so you're going to take her out of the tower? Alright, so as you leave her out of the tower, going down the levels of the tower, you pass several bodies, every one of them slain in similar fashion. A single clean slice across the throat. Coming out to the front of the tower, you see Kaladwin is standing on the drawbridge, meaning kind of somewhat casually, though there is still an alertness to his stance against the chain that braces the drawbridge against the side of the tower you, that they would use to pull it up and down. Um, he appears to just be observing Sinestra, Orzo, and Zirio standing on the landing across from the bridge. Turns to his own. We're walking? We've got two horses. And where are we going? If, if they are, they're, they're down in the stables below. I, I don't know. I don't know what to think anymore. There is one giant vulture that has landed that is landed um, on the edge here that Sinestra is walking, you know, casually over to every now and then just to make sure it's calm before returning to conversation, whatever conversation he's having. I'll be right back, guys. I'm going to get this kid in bed. All right, I'm back. Uh, so where were we? Oh, yeah, um, she explains to you that they might still be in the stables below the tower. I will move you guys down to the basement here. Um, we're going to say Clyde when follows you. <laughs> so the stalls that were previously latched shut that you had seen um, the creatures in before the doors are all unlocked and standing slightly ajar. The room to the south as you exit the towers, the one guard that was previously stationed down here to organize and watch over the, or sell with the wares, lays dead in a pile of his own blood. The vulture in this south seems quite happy by the situation as it is enjoying what remains of the body. Yeah, the remaining beasts are still in the stalls. They appear to be asleep at this time. His name is Kaladwin. He nods. Move up. Um. By the way, the brief bit of sleep you guys did get was enough to count as a long rest if you want to 
hit that to get your spells and shit back. Long rest. Yeah, easily enough. She uh, helps you pull some of the saddles off of the walls, and you guys go about and put them across the various uh, creatures. The saddles appear to be big enough for two people if you want to ride two people per mount using the hippogriffs you guys had used previously or the other giant vultures and the two sub cells. But one of them appears to be more interested in eating what is left in its cell. So what I find is what I heard. He was trying to arrange. It's, it's, uh, I was going to investigate the tower. I wasn't comfortable with us sleeping down there in that room. In the tower of people we just met today. Um, we have seen signs of them. It being allied to various cults in the area. And if what Talon said is true about that woman. He's been cavorting about with and I saw no reason to trust him I went up to try and have a discussion with the commander and on the way up the steps I overheard him speaking to one of those tattooed fellows he had ordered them to wait until we were asleep capture and tie us and throw us off the tower I just simply thought it was prudent to strike first. I couldn't risk you alerting them. It's easier for me to move in the shadows. I'm used to it. At the very least, this way it would have looked like if they'd caught me, I was the only one that was a threat to them. The remaining of you could have reasonably denied any sort of association to me and bargained your release. He smiles, pat you on the shoulder. Yeah, I was hoping to hear that. <laughs> Um, as you're saying that, Kaladin comes just running up the steps. He's not worried about anyone making any noise at this point because, well, everything's fucking dead. Um, he says, uh, the mounts are still in the stables below if you want to use those. There's room for two per saddle if you'd like to ride them instead of the bird, but whatever. I, I don't... Yeah, um, I mean, it's up to these guys up here. It's a metagame moment at that point. Also, you guys all are now level 5 after this grand slaughter, by the way. <laughs> well... Like I said, you guys never took took the time to figure out about this guy. <laughs> yeah, it is the dead of night right now. Yeah, the first four levers are going to be your max HP. The next ones you can either A, roll it, 
or B, take half of your hit die, add one to it, and then add your constitution modifier to it. So if you want to try and roll it to get higher, go for it. You are re-rolling once. Yeah. And then add your con. So if you want to do it the easy way, half your hit die, add one to that. So whatever that is, I think you're a D8, right? Yeah, so you're a D8. So four is five. So take five, add your con modifier to it. So go ahead and do that. Um, if that's what you want to do. Or you can roll it. I mean, it's up to you. <laughs> nice. Sounds like the way to go. <clears throat> so, when you level up, go to your hit die. Whatever your hit die is for your character. Um, I don't know what the hell your hit die is. Um, take half of that. If you want to do it the what I call the easy way. Add one to that, and then just pop it in there. It should add your comp modifier to it automatically. So if you're taking a warlock level, do five, and just put that in your hit pool thing, and it'll automatically add your con modifier to it, and that's your hit points. Hold on. So you're when you level up, you're taking one level of warlock, right? Yeah, he's he's taking a level of warlock. So you take that your hit point, your hit die is one d eight. Um, so you're taking that and you're t cutting the eight in half. You're dividing it by two, so it's four, and you're adding one to that, so it's five. So you're adding five to your hit points right now, and then it'll just it'll handle the rest of it for you. And then whatever spells you're adding to it after that. If he's a Hexblade Warlock... It'll do it. Whoo! Look at you go. Oh shit. Look at here comes Ozo and his third level spells. <laughs> that was like a good use of spells. Woohoo! <clears throat> so, Thalon, as you find yourself with a renewed bit of power and energy coming through you. Um, in a moment of despair, you plead and pray to Kalimbar for more power to help protect those around you. What do you want to say to him?
Did she write it down by chance? Oh no. As you close your eyes and mutter your prayer to him, you see a hooded figure with a silvered mask standing before you, looming before you. You find yourself on a plain gray field, and your entire vision is engulfed by a large visage. It appears to be just a head looming over the horizon. You cannot see the rest of the body. It's so colossal. You have been raised to eye level with this giant beating. Your god, your deity, Kalimbar himself, stands before you, judging you. In a wave of his hand, a giant scale made of golden bones appears before you, weighing on either side of it the deeds you have done. To the left rests all those you have done right by, those that you have helped, those that you have tried to aid, um, those that you have attempted to help to correct the wrongs in their lives. And curiously, looking over this, you see shimmering forms. They appear to be semi-translucent, though not quite entirely there. And you see the visages of your companions, the friends that you've been traveling with this past ten day. Sinestra is standing there with his mischievous, wiry grin a pouch full of coins in his hand as he's just counting them, platinum, platinum pieces just reading between his fingertips as he's counting them out. You find it curious, though, as you've never seen him holding so much money. But who are you to judge the visions your god shows you? You're standing next to him. You see the dark elf companion, Zerio, two axes made of solid ice in his hands, dripping blood, fresh blood pulling around him, coming up to his ankles, rising further and further until it engulfs him to his waist. And then, just as quickly as it arrived, it disappears, the axe fading from his hands. And standing there, indifferent, staring at you, waiting for your judgment. Behind him stands Orzel, looking amused by the whole thing, distracted as he flips through the pages of his books, various arcane sigils and stuff floating in the air in front of him. The priest Kaladwin, standing before you, shining like a bright, shimmering beacon, almost harming your eyes as you stare at him, celestial light radiating off of him. The platform itself, as he appears before you, appears to raise, as if the very presence of this figure shifts the balance in your favor. Standing behind him, to the side in the shadows, is Emin, the tavern owner from your youth. Well, slightly aged and a little more rotund, he appears to be healthy, no worse for the wear, and from what you can tell, happy. Um, it appears as though he looks at you for a brief moment, wistful, as if... Telling you, I miss you, but I'm proud of you. You're doing right. Sitting in the table next to him is a small half-elven girl. She's familiar to you, though you find it difficult to grasp her name. It's evading you. But you're not quite sure. You feel as though you are drawn to her, as if she might still be around somewhere. She might not be lost to you, should you wish to pursue her, to reclaim her. In front of your party members, you see Savra, weeping, conflicted. To her immediate right, the body of the commander, laying in blood, slain now by what you know, the hand of your traveling companion. Zerio, the chilled, frozen blades easily gliding across his tender flesh, spilling his lifeblood on the pillows. No worse, nowhere, unaware of what happened to him, he slips away. 
judged. Your companions to the left of her. Well, not overly friendly, they have a protective stance around them, as if, while they might not agree with your decision, they will stand beside you. On the opposite scale, weighing down, almost falling into the ground, you see your mother, your father, and a pile of the bodies of all of these air nomads. You feel the presence of Kelimbor drawing you forward as you look up to him. He nods. He goes, I will grant you this so long as you keep these scales unbalanced. And he points to your friends and those where the scales are lifted in the air in your favor. And before you falls, a large sword. It appears to be slightly longer than that of a long sword. You know this to be the favored weapon of Kalimbar, a bastard sword. He's bestowed upon you a gift, a sword wrought with a handle of raw bone. It appears to be the femur of some sort of humanoid creature. The, the hand bones crawling up and making the grasp of the guard around it, and a blade of silvery, almost black steel jetting down to a point. When you awake at the sound of Sinestra, bum, 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 banging on the door, frantic, telling you something's wrong, we need to leave. For a brief instant, you see the sword appear in your hand. And as you look to the door, almost out of instinct, you drop it, and it fades away. Though you know, if you ever need it, it's but a call away from you. You are now one level of Hexblade Warlock. And you have in your inventory the Kelimvar's Gift. If you refresh your page, you have the weapon. <laughs> Alright. On that note, the rest of you have been encouraged to run down and get your asses on the mount. Are you doing so? Alright, so Orzo makes his way down. <clears throat> Zerio and Kaladwin do the same. As they reach the bottom of the steps, um, Kaladwin gives you a knowing stare, nods, um, as if in approval gently pat you on the shoulder before stepping into the one of the cells and mounting one of the hippogriffs. So there are... What do we have? Three of them remaining. So are you going to ride with Savra? Or are you going to have her stay here? Is she riding with you? Okay. So she'll ride with you, and we will have you guys, I'm assuming, you heading off to the east toward the canyon? So you're just going to unhook them and set them off? Okay. So you unhook the horses and send them riding off before you run and descend into the tower. Um, so you guys all get on the hippogriffs. You spur them into motion and ride them out of the tower, heading in the easterly direction. As you fly up to stay to soar above the canyon, you see Sinestro waiting for you, hovering there on a rather impatient-looking giant vulture. All right. Any objections? All right. So, as you guys fly off to the east, heading toward the chasm, <clears throat> approaching your way toward the waterfall, an enormous chasm splits the earth as far as the eye can see, and pervasive subterranean darkness, a crude, narrow stairway hugs the rock along the side of the chasm as you approach. You feel as though you probably need to get off your mount and go on foot from here. 
dismounting them and climbing these twist, maddingly twisting hairpin turns around the sharp outcroppings of jagged, uneven stairs, threatening to spill you on the, into the chasm's mouth below. After several treacherous miles, the stairway finally terminates into a broad, flat landing that juts out over the immense black chasm. Out in the gloom, the lost dwarven city lays in ruins before you, like a glittering vault. Broken statues stand in the midst of an empty plazas, staring sightlessly into the darkness. A huge step pyramid rises up at the edge of your vision, and from this moat that appears to be reflecting the surrounding mists of the waterfall whispers off over the chasm's ledge. I'm going to pull Savra in here with you, since you brought her with you. Alrighty, so you guys found yourself outside of these ruins of what you would assume to be the tavern, or the Temple of Air. The carved reliefs of two dwarven faces face one another in a profile to complete an arch just beyond this ledge. Through the arch... <laughs> God damn it. Let me go ahead. No, it's I'm glad you said something. Um, did that fix it for you? Perfect. All right, we'll go with that then. It's apparently there's some sort of fun bug with this thing. All right. So before you um as I said, there's a large door there's a large arch that appears to be made of a couple of dwarven statues that um, frame this doorway down this blocky contours of this sprawl into what is a lost, what you think to be a lost dwarven city in subterranean night. From nowhere within comes an agonizing wail, followed by a breathless rumble, ramble of whispering pleas. The whole city seems to be joined in a chorus of screams from creatures mad with torment. Sarah appears to be a little sheepish at this thing and kind of uh, reluctantly is handing back. Yeah, I need to scale it down. Ton ton ton. <laughs> You're not wrong. Just walking down the hallway. Well, if you're going to be stealthy, you need to roll stealth. Uh, as you walk through, uh, there are various arrow slits lining this hallway as you're walking in. Arrow slits along the walls here. They're facing like whoever's behind these walls can shoot at you. Which one are you looking through? All right, you're gonna attempt to peek through it. Roll perception. Yeah, peering through the arrow slit, you see a 
humanoid feathery creature. Um, it's covered in black feathers from head to toe. It has a red cowl tied about. Looks tattered and torn from these here and there. Hanging from its neck, thanks to your ridiculously high perception roll, you see a small collar engraved upon it, the emblem that marks this as a cult of air initiate. It appears to be just be mimicking the sounds and cries and howls of the undead pain, agony, all those fun little noises you heard when you walked in the cavern first off. From what you gather, it's probably coming from this creature. Um, it has not made any sort of thing threatening toward you, though when it sees you noticing it, it just kind of like hides behind the corner and continues to make the noises a little more urgently and louder in your direction. Attempting to scare you off, basically. <laughs> yes, it knows you're here. You're just going to try and run into the place? Alright, was the rest of you guys keeping up, or are you just kind of move at a casual pace? Alright, bone sword drawn. As you reach for the weapon, you hear tolls and bells, as if ringing for judgment of someone. And whispers, guilty, innocent, guilty, judge that. And the sword just appears in a flame of silvery light into your hand. Sabra is sheepishly following you. Sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> <laughs> it's all just arrow slits. Um, I'm going to actually do this real quick for you, um, Mega. I'm going to give you control, yeah, I'm going to give you control of her for the time being. That way, you can move her around to get her where you want her to go. Um, Kaladwin and Xeria are following you. Uh, Orzo, you probably can't see shit right now. I'm assuming you would like some sort of light source. Alright, well then you're going to need to keep up with Alan if you're doing that. I'll move you up to him. Yeah, I'll move you up to him. If you want to cast your light spell, I'll add some light to your character. I mean, Savra's...
yeah, I mean, if you're running ahead, there's no point in doing it. Um, all right, I'm going to give you a light then. Morzel, there you go. So you've cast your light spell on your staff, I'll say, to illuminate the area around you. Everyone else can now see the light as well, or should be able to. Uh, Sinestra, as you round the corner, you see three tapered obelisks. The sides were inscribed with an ancient pictograph standing in a row. Each of the peaks scrapes, barely scraping the near 15-foot-high ceiling above you. Uh, at the base of each obelisk, facing the southern side toward the hallway where you guys are approaching, is a gaunt human tied around the base. Um, the obelisks around these obelisks are colored cobblestone mosaics depicting Morden with a huge hammer slung over his shoulders. You're going to throw a dart at the guy stuck to it. He's tied to it. He looks to be, um, based from his dress, he's one of the initiates of the cult. It's, it'll hit. These guys are emaciated and exhausted to the point where they're not even giving up a fight. You throw the dart at him and it embeds itself in his face. Ah! What? What are you doing? Leave me alone! Why? Stop! It embeds <laughs> The masters say I have to live on air alone. Leave, leave, leave me, me. Uh, he just expires against the pillar. He did not have much fight in him. So you're gonna walk up and punch him? As you approach him, he's No, leave me alone and he just tries to struggle like to get away from you. As you just lay into him and you're sick and he as his head just collapses in a pool of blood against the spire. What I, while you are doing this, Kaladman comes up, he's What what are you doing? I have no threat to you, man. Zerio approaches from the other side. He's quietly. <laughs> you take the uh, the spikes of your bladed gauntlets and slide them into his throat. Pull them out as he curls up. He tries to yell, but just collapses. Maybe when we're done all this. <laughs> yeah, he's cast his light spell. All right, peering into this room, uh, are you just like peeking into it, or are you actually going inside of this room? All right, um, Zero and Kalabon are going to follow Sinestro, so you guys, I guess, are doing your thing. Uh, looking in, peeking around the corner, um, if you're attempting not to attract anything, you need to roll stealth checks. Um, while you are quiet, Savra behind you stumbles slightly in her step and you hear the jingling of her chainmail armor. 
Thankfully, no one in the room appears to have noticed. Glimpsing in, you see two massive stone pillars, threads, ho holes, threaded holes in the floors and the ceiling of this vast chamber. Um, there are stone beams pierce into these pillars, forming spokes, creating giant wheels. There are two rope figures with whips in their hands, every now and then lashing out at five very sorry, exhausted looking humans, pushing them against these cross beams. Um, Primarily against the westernmost wheel, but occasionally there are a couple of them on the eastern wheel. They are encouraging them to push with all of their might. As these wheels slowly turn counterclockwise, you hear the grinding of enormous gears deep below the stone floors. Now she's been holding a rapier this entire time. <laughs> So if you're entering combat, you need to roll, or you'll get a surprise run, actually. Yeah, go ahead. No, no roll your attack right now. We'll count that as your initiative, but you're going to roll attack because you're getting a surprise round. Uh, nope. As you go to swing at them, he notices you're approaching... Narrowly steps aside, turning and yells out, "Intruders!" Um, let's see. Did you roll? Or Savra will get an attack in if you want to have her go in there and try and swing at him. Um, she has a plus five to hit on her attack rolls. Um, I can roll for her. That's fine. That'll hit, and because she is a champion fighter, that's a critical hit for her. Um, it's going to do a grand total of 10 points of damage to the air priest in front of you. He gasps in pain mid-sentence as her rapier finds its way between the threads and plates of his leather armor, sinking a few inches into his belly. Poor bastard. Uh, on that, it is... Let's see. Did you roll initiative for her, too? Okay. Let's see. Her initiative is... Yeah, so she is... It's going to be her. So she's going to attack again. This is immediately her turn. Hooray for Savra. Yeah, that's going to hit, and she gets two attacks because of the good old multi-attack thing. Uh, first one hits, second one misses. Uh, 11 points of damage to the guy. As he uh, grasps in pain as the rapier again finds its way between the plates of his leather armor. Um, let's see here. Um, Sinestra, you hear the howls of pain and someone yelling out to call for help coming from the hallway. Um, the one that you are looking at currently, uh, looking up at the large stone pyramid above you, you do see a figure perched atop a wolverine who is facing off to the eastern side of the cavern. He has not noticed you yet. That's water. Yeah. You guys want to roll perception on this shit? Uh, 
um, he curls around the edge of this pillar here and looks in, looking down into the pool below. Something glittering down there, looking into the water. And then he looks around the corner and um, notices the same thing you did at the top. He's motioning, shh, and points at the guy on top of the pyramid, perched atop of the wood ring. Uh, let's see. Go ahead. All right, so you can move um two of those squares for your. Oh yeah, so you can move six squares if you wanted to. For your action, and then if you wanted to use, if you wanted to use your full action to move, you can move another six squares. Yeah, if you wanted to use your full action to move. Which way are you heading? <laughs> you do see the torch of Orzol down that way. You would get right there. Yeah. If you want to use your bonus action, you can dash into the room, but that's all you're doing this turn. Alright, if you bonus action dash, you can get as far as to where I just painted the map. If you want to go all the fucking way in there. Alright, that's fine. Alright, so you come in and you just come around the corner real quick. Um, let's see. Fallon went. Or we had. You go. It's going to be. The priest is going to take his turn. This guy back here. Hearing all of the commotion. Steps forward. <clears throat> and seeing you guys and your fun little shit you are doing down here is going to attempt to cast a spell at Fallon. Um, you see what to you, Sinestra, is a familiar incantation of the Witch Bolt spell, and he attempts to lash it out. Yeah, you need to roll now. Um, he attempts to reach out. Wow, one. Nice job, you're in the order. Um, he attempts to reach the spell out at you, Fallon, but seeing the incantation turn coming at you, you just bring the um, Kelimbar's judgments up and whoosh, deflect the spell, sending it scattering into the stone below. Uh, let's see, that then brings us to uh, that would be Thalon's turn. Orzo, if you want to enter combat, you can roll your initiative now as well. <clears throat> Alright, so um, Thalon will be your turn, and then Orzal will go. Alright, make your attack roll. Oh yeah, that'll hit him. And then your sword is 1d10. Uh, I, I couldn't make it do that in the thing there, but it's 1d10 damage. No, it's just, it's one or the other. It's the higher of the two. So your plus seven should be including your charisma modifier. Or, yeah, because you've got a plus three bonus to it, and it's a plus one weapon. So yeah, it's your charisma modifier plus proficiency plus the plus one, which gives you the seven to hit. And then it's um, charisma modifier plus one for the weapon for damage, so it's 1d10 plus four damage. So you did seven points of damage to the guy standing in front of you. Okay. You swing the blade against his throat. He's none too happy about it. But that's all he can do is yell and scream in pain. Um, so that brings us to Zirio, who's going to just run full speed down your way. Um, 
Forzo, you can make your go. Will be a good spin. <laughs> Say firebolt. Okay. Say fireball is going to hurt people. <laughs> nope, you miss. Did you cast a spell? Seeing it come out of him, watching you enter the room, he just steps aside and goes. Poof. Skater across the wall before you. All right. That brings us then to Kaladwin, who's going to run his ass up more. And then it's Sinestra's turn. You're muted, by the way, Sin. <laughs> well, your attack roll hit, so whatever you're doing. <laughs> which one are you, which bolty? Oh, man. Yeah, they're both within 30 feet. The one standing in front of Thalon and Savra is looking pretty fucking hurt. The other one just hasn't been touched yet. Okay. <laughs> I don't think he is. Um, Thalon. Savra, as you guys are frantically battling this priest in front of you, um, Sinestra just kind of weaves a bolt of energy between the two of you, making a bit of an electric fence between you and the priest in front of you at this point now. Uh, the priest uh, in front of you guys, having seen uh, him attempting to cast these fun little spells and feeling a little wounded at this point, is going to uh, he's going to cast the blade ward catcher on himself give himself resistance to slashing and piercing damage and then he's going to take his scimitar and attempt to swing at Thalon and that's going to be a miss As he swings at you, you just parry it aside easily with your blade uh, that brings us back to the top of the round which is Savra's turn um, she's going to, again, take attacks at the fellow in front of you. Attempting to bring the blade around over the witch bolt. As she nimbly parries around your bolt of his thunderous energy, making a fence between the two of them. He just kind of reaches over and jabs him in the throat with a point of her rapier. ba ba -da. She's got a jabby weapon. She rolled an 18, so that gets her a critical hit, which means 8 points of damage to that bastard. Um, let's see. She gets a second attack. If I can type roll better. No, she's got plus 5 to her rolls. Hit. Yep, that'll hit. Your damage. Oh, nice. I couldn't have gotten that one on the first roll in. This guy is like, he looks like he's in his last leg. I mean, he's just gasping for air. She's ventilated his throat pretty damn good. Um, let's see, that comes back to the priest that's further away from you guys. Um, with your witch bolt tethered to him, he's going to take a step back and break your witch bolt tether. 
He's gonna flip you the finger. <laughs> and then weaving his hands in the motion of kind of like a whirlwind, he's gonna after doing that, it feels like he throws something out in your direction. I'm going to need you to make a strength save, Sinestra. <laughs> Where the hell is this kids DC at? Um, you just barely manage to dodge it as he casts a spell. A whirling dervish of dust, dust erupts underneath your feet, and you just step aside and it just whoo, and harmly slams into the ceiling of the nearby to the chamber above you. Uh, at that, it is now Orzol's turn. You there, Joe? Damn it, Joe. <laughs> Alright, well, while he's away, we'll have uh, Fallon, you go ahead and take your turn. Alright, Fallon, go ahead and take your turn while we wait for Joe to come back. Fourteen, you say? Just barely misses. Alrighty, that brings us to uh, Joe. Are you there? No. Go ahead and take your turn, or is all. All right. The fellow standing in front of him, um, by the way, the fellow standing in front of Fallon is looking really beat up. I mean, he's like on his last fucking leg. All right, so cast your first ray at him. If you're casting at first level, yeah, you get three. Yeah, that'll hit. Roll your damage. Nine points of fire damage. You guys are... <laughs> this Thalad and Savar are... Definitely trading blows with this priest and whittling him down a little bit. He's looking ragged, gasping for air, blood pouring from various puncture wounds of Savra's rapier. Or is it all just kind of casually flicks a little bolt of fire at him and it rolls its way around you guys a couple times before pinning him in the face and he screams in agony before slumping to the ground, quite dead. are too damn thick. Whew. That'll hit him. Since you're a cat, man. <laughs> yes. Because you, you're letting your bard play. Uh, you said 17 to hit Joe, right? 19, yeah, that'll hit him. So, nine more points of fire damage, all right. Yeah, that'll hit him. 
to nine points. Nice. Consistent. I like it. Alrighty. Um that brings you to Zerio's turn. Let's see. <clears throat> Rounds the corner and sees these priests that you guys are fighting. <clears throat> He's gonna draw his swords. Flicking his wrists as the two flaming blades appear in his hands and make his attacks against this bastard. Uh, yeah, that's going to hit. I believe it's five for his dex, right? Yeah. 14 points of damage against that guy. Whew. He gets one more attack. Hooray for Rose! Yeah, that'll hit. Why don't I just do... Just do it that way. Another 8 points of damage against him. This guy's looking pretty goddamn rough now. <clears throat> Zerio now holding his flaming swords in front of him. Hooray! Yeah, you get another bonus when you hit 5th level. It adds to your DCs, which is always sweet. Alright, uh, at that, it now comes down to... That guy is fucking dead. So it's Kaladwin's turn. Um, we'll have him turn the corner, assess the situation, and he's just gonna cast an Eldritch Blast on this dude. Uh, what the hell is this guy's Charisma modifier? Or a spell attack bonus? 29,000? Fucking ridiculous! Excuse me. Yeah, that'll hit. Nice! It's a blast of divine energy, energy pounds into the guy's chest. He just pff, falls over. Quite dead. On the floor. Um, surrounding you guys in this chamber are five rather gaunt humans, slaves, they are chained to these large stone wheels here. Um, they were, yeah, they were being whipped and forced to turn the gears one direction or another. They are looking quite frightened at the individuals who just stepped in the room and slaughtered what was their previous slave masters. Alrighty. Dashing around the room, it's a fairly plain stone chamber. You do see, um, looking at the base and the top of these stone pillars that go into the ceiling and the floor, there are chains wrapped around the top and bottom of them that disappear into the floor beneath. That's pretty much it. Oh, uh, Thalon, rummaging through his pockets, you do find a rusted bronze-ish looking key that you assume is probably what you would use to set these guys free. You also find 12 gold coins. <clears throat> As you approach him, he appears frantic and scared. What do you, what do you, what do you want? You're not gonna kill me, are you? Please, I just want to see my family. I'm, I'm from the village of Belair. I just took the road to the north. I was trying to transport goods down toward the Red Larch. They ambushed my caravan on the road. Please, let me free. All right, you undo his shackles, and without a thought to himself or you guys, he just mutters thank you, and then whoosh, fucking balls, he's gone. Just runs out. Yes.
as you muddle through the incantation and attempt to enchant the blade, the enchant does not hold and has no effect. It appears there is already an enchantment of similar or stronger on this weapon. <laughs> While you guys are muttering with those spells, Zirio has made himself busy just running around and picking the locks on the chains of the people in the room. He's set two of them free so far, and you have seen them run by you and out of the room, and presumably into the wilderness beyond. That's all there is on the site. Check the other wheel. He says as you pass him by Thalon. Um, so he walks off to the reel. You hear the frantic police. Turk! What? Not enough Turk! I've got to don't kill me! <laughs> He's freaking out because there's a dark elf standing next to him. Um, let's see. We're going to attempt to persuade him. Uh, your presence alone is enough to kind of calm him down. We'll call it as an aiding, a helping action. We'll give him advantage on this roll. He raises his hands. Um, in doing so, his weapons just fade from him. And he appears to be unarmed before him. I mean you no harm. Speaking in low, soft tone. And attempts to calm him. I'm going to get you out of here. Find your family. He, after calming the man down, Daphne picks the locks and he... I just thanks just gone runs out here you go he's uh he looks at you sees a sword in your hand with bones around the grip and pisses his pants You just let go of your sword as if to drop it, and it appears to just fall the way of the tip of the blade, taking precedence, and just kind of falls into the ground. It disappears. <laughs> I think his cat's hungry or something. Yes, cat. Alright, so you unlock his shackles. He looks around you, notices Cyber standing behind you, and uh, it kind of mumbles through an apology and then just pushes his way through you guys and again just runs the hell out of the room and is fucking gone. You hear a yell, Oh God! as you run by what you presume is probably the corpse that um, Sinestra had pincushioned with darts before vanishing into the darkness beyond. Are you speaking to Sevra? Uh, as you look upon the, um, looks to be early 20-ish blonde uh, female warrior, she's wearing chainmail armor with a tabard over it, um, with a feathered wing kind of sewn into the left breast. It appears that this is, from what you presume and your knowledge of Waterdeep, the original emblem that was the Feathergale Spire group regalia. Um, She's kind of a little out of breath after the recent bounce. I'm Savra. You are? I'm not sure who's looking after who.
She looks down at it, reappears, smiles at you, and holds it out. She holds the, holds the rapier out in front of you. Alright, so you cast the enchantment upon the weapon. This time, it takes hold. The weapon sheens, shines with a brief blue light shimmering before a... Uh, <laughs> Before the enchantment appears to just subside, the blade shimmers slightly and appears to give off a slight light, and uh, your enchantment has taken hold. Seeing you do this, um, Calabron walks over, uh, noticing that there is a light shining from you and Savra being humans. Uh, do, do you, can you see down here? She turns to me and says, No, no I can't. Let me help you with that. And he casts the light spell on the rapier you have enchanted. So now she, too, has the ability to see where the fuck she's going. Yeah. Uh, these guards, from what you presume, can see in the darkness here somehow. Yeah, maybe next time ask before you murder people, you murder hobos. Uh, no, Thalon walked in and attacked them first. Uh, Sinestra, walking down these various halls between these rooms here, these appear to be furnished living quarters, apartments, though none of them appear to be used now. From what you can gather, they might be some sort of guest quarters. For those they invite in here, either to be as initiates or maybe someone visiting from somewhere. You're not quite sure what the cause would be, but it occurs to you that should you guys need to rest, this is excuse me, this is probably the safest space to do it, as you could reasonably fortify the doors in the area here. To try and find the key for right, Romans around these buildings are more or less intact the furnishings and decorations most of them have been removed there are bits and shards of rubble some broken pottery and bits of bone littering the floor you do as I said before find there is a bed a albeit kind of crooked table in some of the rooms and um, a set of broken slanted shelves across some of the walls though whatever was on them is long since gone Yep, it has faded by now. It's uh, living quarters, the same thing you just saw Sinestro walking through. They're just... Alright. What are you doing, Orzal? Yeah. Roll an intelligence check. Wow. So from what you can tell by the function of the gear, the giant gears and how they work, they control the water level of something nearby. Um, you haven't seen anything nearby that is water related, but from the way they work and the mechanisms involved and just peeking through and seeing the gears below, they remind you of the various locks and gates you have seen around the bays and rivers of the city of Waterdeep. Son of a monkey. Is that better? Okay. All right. So as I was saying, um, from looking around investigating them and from your previous knowledge of the various bays, locks, and rivers and such around the cities of Waterdeep used to transport goods, they appear to hit, gauge or control levees, gates, or locks that would control the water level or the in, 
intake or an outtake of nearby water. Um, as you entered, you would have seen a the waterfall going down into the um, the chasm below. From your guesstimate and with your wonderful intelligence check there, you presume that maybe these control the gates that would either feed that waterfall or prevent that waterfall from going over into the chasm. All right. And as you step out, uh, we're just going to have Cloud, but it's going to be following you around. Um, Sinestra, just the same thing you're finding up there. It's just various apartments and living quarters. All right. Um, peeking in the room, you see two of the familiar feathered figures that you had seen peeking through the arrow slits in the front of this dungeon, we'll call it. <clears throat> Against the back wall, you see various frescoes covering. Uh, one is depicting the creation of the dwarves by Moradin, by your knowledge of religion, you would understand this. The other is a massive battle between orcs and dwarves. Um, the far wall is pocketed and pitted with holes in the masonry where gemstones, you presume, had once surrounded the altar and that is shaped like an anvil. Um, there are now chipped remnants of garnets and agates remaining. In the middle of the room, you see three of these bird-headed creatures, and they are tormenting a group of shackled prisoners. Full stealth. As you barge in, the three bird-like creatures put themselves against the back wall and squawk in your direction. Um, as you enter, one of them draws a sword sword and begins to approach this human here against the wall. Are you going to do anything to intercede? I mean, you can run out and just kick his ass in the teeth if you want to do that. Alright, so as he goes to it, um, I need you to roll a dexterity check. Oh no. So as you run at him, he sees you and squawks an alarm and frantically lashes out with a short sword of the human. Thankfully, you're charging in there and distracting him. The sword clink, and nicks off the wall nearby, and he, what the crap? And he just kind of like dodges to the side, trying to put some distance between himself and the bird man. Oh, yeah, go ahead and roll initiative. Nice. Oh, the poor guy rolled a one. And then we'll roll it for um, Savra. I think she gets plus five to it. Alright, so uh, it's going to be you going first, Alan. Roll your attack. Is it 15? Yeah, that'll hit him. Oh, nice. Seeing him lunge out and as his weapon is no longer prepared, you bring your sword down and poof, across his arm and goes poof, and just fumbles to the ground. He goes, ah, no! Traitor! And his bleeds out, falls to the ground. Twitching spasmatically. And the other two, traitor, 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 traitor! 
They appear to be squawking and mimicking. Uh. <laughs> uh, wouldn't you like to know? On that, um, it's going to be Zerio's turn again. He's going to dash in toward this guy here, drawing his sword as he goes. Yeah, that's going to hit. I think it's... Oh, it went up. Nice. So it brings the blade down and... Scorches across the chest of it and the thing goes... And it just slumps against the wall dead. The remaining bird, looking quite cornered... Um, turns at you, Thalon, and throws a sword at you. It goes bang, da, 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 and clatters off into the stones below. And that makes it Cypher's turn now. Um, I presume she's just going to walk in here and stab the last one. She gets a second attack. That one misses. Oh, that was Sinestro rolling. Shit. Ooh. Best fire to those. That would still miss. Um, you want to roll again for her one more time just to... Since I... There you go. Uh, yeah, that would hit. So then she does 1d8 plus... I think since she's got a plus 1 on her weapon right now, it makes it plus 6. So... 1d8 plus 6. No, plus 5, sorry. 1d8 plus 5 for her damage. Takes a rapier and definitely threads it between his collarbones and he's. <coughs> Traitor! Um, let's see here. It comes back to your turn, Thalon. No, the other two are dead. Here, let me do this real quick for you. I've been doing this since here, and I just forgot to do it in these ones. These guys here, they be El Dedo. Are you going to cast a Word of Radiance on it? Alright. Yep, yeah, that'll hit him. So roll your damage out. So as he's squawking traitor incessantly, you just flick the tip of the blade across his throat and, goes, ah, ah, and it slumps across the altar before falling back against the wall. Quite dead. <laughs> you get the sense that they just mimic things they hear around them. All five of the prisoners in this room are chained to the wall. They're all human men. Take the key and turn it in there, and sure enough, click, shackles fall off his wrist. Rubs his wrists, kind of rubbing the wounds and sores where the manacles were tightly clasped. Uh, thank you. I, I, I don't know. It's the first I've I've heard him say that. They usually just mimic what they hear from the other cultists running around the hallways outside. Just shakes his head. A 
as you go to leave, he grabs your shoulders and says, Please, if you're going to go, keep going further. My wife, Nerissa, she was taken below by the cultists. If you could, if you could find her, please, send her home. Thank you. Let the rest of them free, and they, uh, as you set them free, they go and retrieve the, um, the weapons that the Kenku had. So three of them go and pick up the short swords that the Kenkus had, and they, um, move their way out of the room and enter into one of these side rooms here. So, um, as he's walking out, he says, I'm gonna find some place here that's that looks safe if you if you find her send her up to us I'm, I'll wait for her or for you whichever comes first on the way out here all right. so these guys are all gonna go there this one guy's just gonna get the fuck out and as you're making your way out so you're patch on the shoulder it's well done Just says, well done, pat you on the shoulder. Just nods. Walks out of the room. Alright, Sinestra, where are you going? Where have you gone? Oh, he's... Oh, okay. So... You guys want to uh, all meet up and move in a group here, or are you just going to continue to run off willy-nilly? Uh, I was going to say, it's getting late here. If you guys want to call it a night here, we can pick it up next time. Because it is at 11 o'clock now, which is around where we're going to stop. We're scheduled to stop, rather. <clears throat> Uh, Kaladwin, uh, approaches you guys, I have an idea, if you would hear me for a minute. <laughs> no. Well, never mind then. Good night. I can cast a spell that will provide a shelter around eight hours or so. If you so wish. <laughs> Where would you like to set this up? In the middle of this kind of living room here. We can move these rubble out of the way here and use this larger chamber here. Alright. <laughs> so you drag it bed into the space? <laughs> Zero seeing you do the same. I I like that idea. And he goes and does the same. So you guys have dragged in a bed here, and we're gonna put he puts his uh, the other one against the door here, and <laughs> he lays down in it quite comfortably. And then our friend here is going to cast a. I couldn't do it that way. Bummer. He's going to cast Lehman's Tiny Hut, which protects you guys and prevents anything hostile from entering the space. So, there you go. There's your little safe bubble for the night. And we'll call everybody getting a long rest. You guys have officially passed nearly two days in a single session. Well done.
well, it's about two days have passed now since you guys have taken two long rests. You've been inside this place here now for uh, almost a whole day at this point. <laughs> Alright, well, we'll pick this up next Friday and continue our adventure through the Howling Halls here. And see what mischief you guys can get yourselves up to. Alrighty. <laughs> so you go and you drag yourself a bed well yeah so we'll put it right there in the corner of it there you go. You'll have the corner there. <laughs> no, you haven't told anybody this. Zerio is aware of it. Oh, interesting point, by the way. Um, for your perception roll you did while you were resting. After he snuffed that torch out, you could not see him in the darkness when he left the room. He made a point of putting the torch out before you guys went to bed in that room. Even if you rolled a nat 20, you wouldn't have seen him. <clears throat> no, you did. You were working purely on site. Well, it is pitch black in there, and um, but he has night vision. But you didn't succeed over his twenty-seven sleight of hand. <laughs> He's invisible in darkness. <laughs> I'm not coming back next Friday. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> the fun of the Gloomstalker Rangers. Um. So we'll pick this up again the 12th of April is this month at 8 p.m. On that note, we're going to end the stream. Good night, folks.